Can everyone see that presentation now? Yeah, great. So, um, so the, the topic for today that we were asked to talk to everyone about is how to reduce our um, individual um, carbon footprint. And the good news is there's lots that we can do um, to reduce it. Um, and we'll be talking about some of the most important things um, to do today. So there is a sense of prioritising within that. Um, so we're talking as part of um, Parents for Future South West London. So Parents for Future is an international grassroots activist group. Um, and we set up about a year ago um, a South West London division um, of it. So speaking to Today, you've got me and Marta. Uh, that's me on the right. Um, I've got three kids, I've got twin boys and a girl, um, and I've lived in ones for about 20 years. Um, and been really in, interested in and active in, in climate awareness uh, for the last 10 years, probably. Um, that's me. Marta, do you want to say hello? Yes, of course. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, it's great to see so many people joining. Um, uh, my name is Marta and I, I've, I've been in, living in Wandsworth for the last two years and I absolutely love it. My, I have two kids as well, four and seven, and they go to Shaftesbury Park Primary. And I have been involved with Parents for Future for a year now, but just as Meg, you know, environment was on my mind for quite a long time. Um, so, yeah, that's me. Thank you. So just a bit of um, background further to, to Parents for Future and what it stands for. There's four central pillars. This isn't just the South West London bit. This is the whole organisation. Uh, there's sort of four key themes that really you know, matter to us. One adults to act so it's great to see so many of you have turned up wanting to act and wanting to know how to play your part we also know though that sort of individual actions can only count for so much so a big part of what we do a big focus for us um, as a group is about lobbying for change um, on a more systemic um, level so as much as it's about individual actions and individual responsibility for us those two things go hand in hand and the fourth one is about supporting young people I don't know if you saw in the news today a survey of um, child psychiatrists that half of the children they're now and teenagers that they're now seeing are going with climate related anxieties um, so we want to support them both mentally as they come to terms with that but also in their, their own endeavours and activities that they're doing to try and force adults to take responsibility um, for the climate emergency. So just just to get us started, I think just let's just focus our mind on why we're here and why this matters. Um, I don't think anyone on this call would disagree that we are in a climate emergency. It's something that even ones with council has, has agreed um, is an emergency and therefore requires urgent attention. We also know that this is a problem of our own doing. This is human made. That we, and responsible for the world that we're going to leave behind for future generations. But the good news is um, we have solutions. This is this is all very much in our in our grasp. This isn't a sort of um, hopeless situation. It's difficult. It's going to be really hard, but there are things that we can do. and We know where we should be focusing our efforts. Yes, right. So so what is carbon footprint? Um, it's a uh, yes. Let's Amy, can we move? <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so uh, it is a quite a complex uh, concept, actually, and there's no one definition and and most of all, the measuring system is not really in place right now uh, for the for this presentation. We're actually using the definition created by Professor Mike Berners-Lee, who actually is a, a specialist, world class specialist, um, uh, and he's working specifically on the carbon footprint, and he's the author of a really wonderful book called uh, How Bad Are Bananas? And lots of uh, data in this presentation comes from this book. And I absolutely recommend this to everyone who wants to have like a further read. It's a quick read, one hour, one hour and a half, and gives you a really good um, sort of idea of, of the problem. So what uh, what Professor Berners-Lee says, uh, carbon footprint is is essentially a best estimate of um, uh, best estimate that we can get of of the full climate change impact of of something. It can be an activity, an item, a lifestyle, a person. And um, when he says climate change impact, he means emissions of all greenhouse gases. That includes. Um, uh, uh, carbon dioxide, obviously, but also methane and nitrous oxide and some other uh, other gases. Um, and then when we're talking about this, there you will find in the presentation uh, symbols uh, CO2 or E. Uh, so uh, when we when we put CO2, that means carbon dioxide. CO2E, 
uh, means uh, all the greenhouse gases. So uh, it, some data sets will have will look only at the carbon dioxide emissions. Some data sets will look at the whole of of, of the emissions. And unfortunately, uh, there's no alignment here yet. And the another thing that we need to take into account while we're talking about carbon footprint is is um, direct and indirect emissions. And actually, that's probably what complicates this concept so much. And and especially when it comes to measuring. Uh, and I think the best way to describe it is to use a car example. So when you look at you, you know your car and you're thinking about the emissions uh, from from the car, you shouldn't just take into consideration the the emissions that come from driving the car. Um, you have to take uh, into account the emissions that were created. Uh, during the production process of the car, the extraction of materials that come uh, in the car, um, the transport of all the different bits and pieces. And then um, on the other hand, you should consider also um, the emissions that come with extraction of crude oil that is used for the petrol transportation, the whole manufacturing process. So it is a really complex uh, system and that's why it's so hard uh, to, to sort of define and measure carbon footprint. Right, let's move on. Uh, so this is a quick one. Just wanted to show you, you know, that carbon footprint differs across the world. Uh, carbon footprint per person per year differs across the world. Essentially, the the, the developed countries, rich nations of the world, usually have a, a much higher uh, carbon footprint per person than those uh, developing. And and the United States is the leader, <laughs> absolute leader here. Um, UK uh, for, with 13 tons is is actually quite uh, average for, for Europe. Uh, I think interestingly, uh, it, when you look at China, it's just eight, slightly more than the world average, less than 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 the UK. And, uh, you know, you may ask yourself, how come, you know, China is the responsible for the quarter of, of carbon emissions uh, uh, across the world? It's just because, uh, you know, those it's a it's a world factory and uh, we are responsible uh, for most of those uh, for a, for a large part of those emissions that are created by China and they are taken into our carbon footprint. Um, yes, so Amy, we can go further. Thanks. Yes, so. Uh, it, what needs to happen over the next 10 years so that we kind of remain within the climate, within the Paris uh, Agreement goals, we just need to reduce those carbon emissions um, uh, quite heavily, especially we uh, people of the developed nations um, uh, who are consuming most and creating most of those emissions. We have the responsibility um, and, and we should cut our carbon emissions by about 70 to 75 percent over the next 10 years. So let's go back to UK, <laughs> and uh, so you, so our average annual average per person is 13 tons, and obviously that that differs. Everyone is different. Everyone has a different lifestyle, and um, uh, so you know, for some people who are flying a lot, who are eating a lot of meat, uh, buying a lot of clothes, that that won't be 13 tons. That will be probably closer to 20. But those who are living a kind of a minimalistic lifestyle it's going to be below. But let's talk average in this presentation. So when we look at the details of this um, uh, of this carbon, oh, can we go back? Yeah, uh, look at the details uh, and you have them on diagram it, that, you know, it's it's kind of evenly split across uh, the four main uh, sort of um, uh, sources of our human activity uh, and everything else. Here means uh, basically non-food consumption, services consumption, and that includes also public services consumption, like like NHS, like police, like education, and so on. Yes, let's go further. <laughs> Right, so how do we reduce that carbon footprint? We have quite a lot of job to do uh, over the next 10 years. So yeah, let's talk some practicalities. Um, so first of all, um, you know, I think everyone should look at it as a project <laughs> and, and should look at it as a long term project rather than, a, you know, a, a, a sprint one, like, like a longer run, a marathon rather than a sprint. So first thing you do, you just have to you have to check where you are. Right. So check your cal cal uh, calculate your footprint. And there are plenty of, of calculators um, available online. We kind of like the one that was developed by Worldwide uh, Fund um, because it's, it seems quite accurate and it also provides you with some, some ideas and solutions. Um, and then once you have it measured, you know, you know what, what kind of percentages, what is your sort of what area of your life 
um, is the most impactful, pick your battles, um, you know, just, just kind of plan whether you want to really, you're very motivated and you want to make a huge change or you just want to go, you know, um, step by step and, and make small changes. It also it depends on your, you know, on your financials because some of those changes come with an investment. So, so pick your battles and plan, uh, and plan that out and uh, we te we suggest three different applying three strategies you can apply them all at once or you can just pick uh, cherry pick uh, uh, some of them have fewer, higher impacts others have uh, smaller the first one uh, we call that improve it's essentially about um using more efficiently what you have improving the use of things that you currently have has a smaller impact than, than others, but still has has quite a lot of, uh, you can still achieve quite a lot. The the second one, uh, we call it shift, um, and uh, that one will essentially bring a, a, a huge change to your carbon emissions, but obviously that comes at a price, and it's either a, a real price, money, price, value price, or um, it comes with a behavioral change, and not everyone, uh, you know, is is able to 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 make it uh, quickly and then the last uh, strategy is avoiding it's more i would say sort of tactical so you're avoiding um uh, ha carbon heavy solutions you're uh, avoiding things that come at a high price of uh, of carbon emissions right so i think uh, yeah i think we can move on <laughs> with, with practicality so meg over to you yeah i'm going to start with food um i think most people when you think reducing your carbon footprint people think about the the bigger obvious things that are more commonly associated with that like flying or driving um but food as you saw from those slides that uh, that marta shared earlier um accounts for a big proportion of our carbon footprint a quarter of it um, and so making changes in this area can have um, a huge impact um the first one of those is, is obviously waste i talked on wednesday at the food and recycling talk um about the that and you know if you think about it's nuts a third of all food um, that's, that we have um, gets um, wasted. And most of that is from homes. It's not supermarkets and restaurants. You know, we're the villains um, in this piece. Um, a lot, you know, three quarters of land being used for meat and dairy production. And, and there were some awful pictures in the news yesterday about um, deforestation of big areas of Australia. Uh, as we know, a lot of the Amazon rainforest has been destroyed for that. And that's really a carbon heavy way of eating and you know, eating red meat, um, eating lots of dairy products. Um, you might be surprised to know that if, you know, if your household gets through two and a half pints of milk a day, which is not unfeasible for a large family, um, that's a tonne of carbon dioxide per year. So that's as much as a flight from London to New York. So that just, I think, gives some context to how big um, an impact shifting your food patterns um, can have. So if we go on to the next one, if we just take on that, for that first um, point about waste, um, this is this, this has a big impact. This, 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 not only will it save you money, but you can also be saving the planet in, at the same time. So if you start thinking about buying only what you need in the amounts in which you need, so things like supermarket three for two offers, things like that, that are all designed multi-pack, they're designed to keep you buying more and more and more things that you possibly don't need, especially if they haven't got a long um, shelf life on them. Um, there's other stuff you can do as well to use, you know, make make use of what you have. So things like um, apps like Kitchy can help with that. Meal planning uh, is old fashioned but it really works. Um, but Kitchy is like a sort of modern version of that, so using the available technology um, to help you plan and to help you make um, nice meals out of what otherwise might get chucked into the bin. And that can have a huge saving, as you can see on the slide, in terms of carbon emissions. The other big one, as I said, eating you know, meat, particularly red meat um, and dairy products, um, is, is a really carbon heavy way of, of eating and, 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 and making a shift. So if you're thinking about, about those three strategies that shift to a plant based diet, even if you can't commit, it, commit to doing that. So seven days a week full time, shifting to do it most of the time or more of the time it will have an impact. And if you can do it consistently, you can cut your, your carbon footprint from food by 70 percent, which is huge. Um, so, and around 20 percent of your your total carbon footprint. So this is this is kind of really worth investing the time to think about how would me, how would my household move to a more plant-based diet? And you might find you enjoy it and you feel healthier for it as well. The things to avoid, so we've talked about some red meat, talked about dairy, but there's some other ones as well. So, you know, I think rationally, we all know that in the UK, we, we can't grow strawberries in December, but the supermarkets will be full of them. 
So if the, the, you know, everyone will want some tomatoes, strawberries, all, asparagus, foods like this all year round that are actually only naturally grown for a very short season um, in the summer. Um, if you see them in supermarkets, either because they've been um, imported, they've been air freighted, which obviously means they have a really heavy carbon footprint. It's a heavy thing to transport by plane um, or they've been grown in a hothouse. So sometimes we can sort of kid ourselves and think, oh, it's got a UK flag on it. It's been grown here, hasn't been air freighted, so it must be OK. But actually the, the sort of energy used to uh, resource those um, hot houses is really carbon intensive. Um, so try and eat seasonally and it can have a huge impact. And on the next slide, we look at um, that strawberries example um, just to, to give a sense of the, the figures there. So it grown in season locally, 490 grams of, of carbon dioxide. Um, but if you look at them flown in from South Africa or even grown in locally um, in a hot house, um, it's over three and a half kilos. So it's a huge jump um, in, in terms of how you must see those those products. Right, so next one up is, is, is travel. Uh, that accounts for about 27% of average individual footprint. Um, and so first of all, some, some data just to give you a little more, a broader view. Uh, one third of all car journeys in London are below two miles. That essentially means that they can be made easily walking or, or cycling or using public transport. 90% of the time, uh, cars are parked. So it, it's like, you know, if you think about it, it's just 10% of uh, we're, we're, use, we're not using our cars most of the time. Um, and then another data, which is quite striking when you think about it, it's not related directly to the carbon emissions. However, you know, uh, well, we, when we're driving our cars, when we're using vehicles, we're actually creating another big uh, problem, which is uh, which is all those particles that uh, that basically kill us. So nine thousand Londoners die each year because of air pollution, and um, and then flying. This is a, a big thing for British people. Uh, actually, we fly much more on average than anyone uh, than other, uh, apart from US, uh, obviously, but they're big on everything. Um, but uh, if you if you if you're a frequent flyer, your your carbon emissions are huge. You have here an example of of an economy flight, return flight from London to Hong Kong, and that's three and a half tons. But if you want to travel in luxurious conditions, let's say, and you pick a first class um, a flight, uh, your carbon emissions are going to be fourteen tons. So that's that's a, that's a pretty expensive flight. Yeah, so, so the first strategy, obviously, is, is to improve the, improve the use of, of, of the car. And uh, if you don't have a car or you're considering buying a new one, well, maybe think again. 90% uh, of the time, you're not going to use it. Um, uh, so the, and, the, and when you have to use it, there are lots of different options right now available to people. You can either rent it from a company like, like Zipcar, Enterprise, whatever. But there are also lots of, uh, lots of apps, lots of um, uh, options. Uh, that allow uh, you to rent a car uh, which is owned by someone else and and if you do have a car you can also rent it out to people who need it um, uh, and actually earn money on this so so just consider renting instead of, of buying and and I, I would say that uh, I think quite convincing is that a new car comes at at carbon price as well and it differs obviously from uh, from four tons for a, for a small you know a small car up to 25 tons uh, for a Range Rover and and obviously a Range Rover comes with huge huge uh, emissions as well much bigger than a small car and then uh, the third thing is is to if you do have a car just try, drive sustainably try to you know drive smoothly drive slowly um, don't idle and that's actually forbidden by law isn't it so and we see so many people idling and and it's and it's quite depressing especially when you're uh, when you're at the school drop off and you see all those cars idling outside the school gates tire pressure is another thing to check uh, it can lower your emissions i i as I remember, about 15%, I think. So, so that's quite a, quite a big impact. And obviously, lighten your load. If you have some boxes, uh, you know, on the back of your car, just get rid of them. And, and use your car uh, mo to the most. Like, you know, just try not to drive on your own. Uh, if you, uh, you know, if you go to work, I know that now it's not a very common thing to drive to work, but, it, but hopefully we're, we're going to be back someday on the roads. So, so if you have to drive, just ask whether there are, you know, some co-workers that can go with you um, so you can actually lower your emissions up to 80% on that, on that journey. Um, 
yeah, I guess we can move further. So the shifting thing, obviously, that always comes at a huge saving. And and the best thing you can do is is essentially ditching your car and moving to uh, active travel, uh, which basically means um, walking, cycling, uh, or using public transport. Um, and that's going to save you even 98% of, of, of your uh, travel emissions. And here is a really nice example uh, to, to show you the difference in emissions between uh, a car and, uh, um, and uh, a bus or other public transport. So you can see that the carbon emissions per person per mile are 11 and a half times more on a car than they are on a half full a London bus. Right, and, and the last thing is, uh, avoid flying and and that's essentially a big thing you can do actually uh, we've been sort of uh, you know tricked by the the um, airlines to thinking that it's so great to have you know those city breaks uh, hand parties uh, in barcelona or or even uh, you know wedding celebrations in italy and that comes at a huge huge cost for the environment so so if you can avoid flying just just do it or reduce the number of flights you take a year you can, switch to train travel. Um, my friends traveled to Barcelona uh, last year on a train um, with their kids and they loved it. So, you know, you, you kind of take, you can can take the most of your trip. You can, you, you see the changing landscape, you see the changing architecture, you actually see the world, right? So, so that, that, that is really nice, uh, nice thing to do. Thanks, Marta. I'm going to talk about um, consumption. Well, I've got a bit of feedback on my microphone. Have you? Is that sound okay, Marta? Can you hear me all right? Good. Okay. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's go on to the next one, but because this 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 is again, this is just under a quarter of your your individual um, footprint, um, and we've got some um, figures to to show how that breaks down here. So, um, on average, if you live in the UK, clothing only takes up um, a small proportion, about two percent of your footprint. But if you buy a lot of clothes, remember that's an average figure. So that includes people like my dad, who never buys any clothes new ever. Um, if you buy a lot of clothes, especially if you buy things like fast fashion, um, so a lot of UK high street um, clothing, it could be 10 times that, so a lot of your carbon footprint um, actually just coming from your wardrobe. Um, we know only 1% of old clothing gets um, recycled, um, which I think is, is shocking to me. I'm going to talk a lot about Christmas. So we've got a little special bonus Christmas section at the end because it's so important as a proportion of our carbon footprint. Um, but also I think it's just beyond Christmas sort of thinking all year, um, um, about the, the way we buy and sort of how easy it is to buy things almost without really thinking um, and, and doing that kind of like mindless rather than mindful shopping, buying things that we don't really need um, online. You know, there's only so many days in the year, there's only so much stuff that we can wear, there's only so many things that we, we can use and do. And a lot of things are bought um, to be worn once or used once, um, which is pretty depressing. Um, so the first one is just about improving you know, what you have, repairing um, instead of buying new, upscale it, find a new way of doing something with it or styling something or using it in a different function, um, pass it on to someone who's going to love it if you can't, but just making more of what you already have um, and thinking about buying fewer things to last, you buy quality, something that you're going to love for a very long time. I don't know if anyone's watched Repair Shop um, on the BBC, but it's a really soothing uh, lockdown watch if you haven't, um, because you just see the joy people get from having something restored that, that really matters to them, that they really um, love. We don't have loads of those in Wandsworth, but um, hopefully they're, they're growing. Um, the next one is about shifting to a more circular model, so embracing the circular economy. Um, I love buying second-hand clothing. It's a great way of not looking like everybody else, and it's also a good way of supporting local charity shops. Um, there are loads of things that you can do online as well, but we're lucky, you know, in this area, we've got loads and loads of really good um, secondhand shops. Um, it's not just clothing as well, you know, things that things that can be passed on and used. So with, uh, food we've talked about already, but, you know, Olio is an app that's used for um, shops and restaurants to get rid of waste food. Um, so something that's literally going for nothing. Free cycle as well. Um, you can pick up all sorts of things like bikes and stuff for the home um, on free cycle, which is great. And you can also rent things from designer goods to... Um, um, things that you perhaps need to do a bit of DIY it's just it's not worth buying one because you're only going to use it for that particular task and you can borrow it um, and it, even things like using street whatsapp groups and next door and things like that to, to make local connections in your community and borrow things 
there's a great way of not buying something. We've got Black Friday coming up, uh, one of my least favourite days of the year. Um, we all hate it, but you know everyone loves a bargain. That's you know human nature. Um, and we've got these events that are created to make you buy things without thinking because you've got not got time. The clock is ticking against you, so you must rush to get that deal and get the cheapest price and things like that. So it makes sense. Um, but we also know that um, these are that a lot of these things are not going to get used long term. The, this is this is and I work in advertising, so I know about this. So um, things as well like emails, um, you, you, you know, all those um, companies that have your details to tell you know to tell you about their latest offers and things like that, and they're all designed to make you buy things that you probably don't actually um, need. And avoiding them is just a great way of saving yourself money and also to um, reduce your carbon footprint. So a lot of it on the next slide is just about becoming. Um, a more conscious consumer so really rather than that kind of buying it without thinking buying on impulse um it's making much more sort of slow considered thoughtful purchases so where does it come from do i really need it if we don't have things at the moment um like a carbon tax um maybe one day we will but if there was a limit on how many new things you could buy in a year you would have to go through all this kind of thought process and really consider whether it's something you're buying for life or something that you might only wear once and is, is this one of those very very few things that you want to buy to hang on to whatever Right. Okay, home. Um, home accounts for about 25% of, of average footprint. And I would say that we left it at the end because um, when it comes to homes, um, the changes come at a quite a heavy price sometimes and not everyone can can afford that price. So we, we actually need, a, a, you know, our governments and, and our um, um, councils as well to, to help us with, with the cost. And actually, uh, right now, uh, Boris Johnson just on Wednesday announced that uh, that green 10 point plan and and it, we were quite happy to see that it included the extension extension of of the greenhouse uh, grant uh, which actually allows uh, individuals to to get funding from from the government to green their homes and to improve uh, the uh, de de decrease the carbon uh, footprint of their homes Yes, but so so just just yeah. When we look at the data uh, coming from our houses, I think that the most striking one is that uh, when we look at UK, uh, the that we are our housing stock is is the worst in Europe, essentially, and it's worst in Europe in terms of of, of energy efficiency. And it, it it is because most of our housing stock is old. It's is just fifteen percent has been built after nineteen ninety when some sort of energy efficiency um, uh, rules came in. Uh, and I, I guess here in Wandsworth, uh, you know, we have lots of houses from end of 19th century, the beginning of 20th century, um, lots of conservation uh, houses as well. Um, so that's a big challenge. But that also means that, you know, the, the, the state of our houses is uh, in terms of energy efficiency is, is awful. And then um, another one uh, that 30 percent of, of the heat that is that we're produced that we're producing, you know, while heating our houses is lost. Is wasted uh, through 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 doors, through windows uh, and floor. And um, that's quite stunning when you think about it, especially uh, you know when you think how um, easy you can fix this. And then my favorite data: 75% of the electricity used uh, to power electronics is consumed while the product products are actually not working at all, which is a complete waste. When uh, you know, it's 75%. That's that's amazing. So first, and, and I'm going to go really quickly. We had an amazing session on Wednesday, uh, greening your home um, as, uh, at the summit here. And we had lots of uh, much more uh, knowledgeable people talking about it than, than myself. But basically, you know, when we talk about the improve, improvement strategies, it's all about savings and it's all about saving the, that energy and, uh, you know, kind of reminding ourselves all those uh, things our mom, moms and dads uh, or grandmothers told us, you know, turn the lights off when you don't need them, uh, turn off your devices uh, if you don't if you don't need them, if you're if you're not working with them, uh, just boil the water that you need in your kettle uh, for the tea, not you know the whole liter, and also boil with a 
cover on because that's essentially a loss of a lot of heat. Um, and uh, obviously the biggest savings here come with with um, like insulation of your house. Um, but as I said, that that can come quite costly. But there are simple things you can do with drought proofing um, your windows, your doors, your chimneys, and that's that doesn't come at a at a high price and can still save uh, save a lot of um, uh, a lot of carbon and save a lot of money as well. So the, the shift uh, obviously you can make is to renewables. However, here I would just like to say one thing, and I and I, I suppose it was also mentioned on the Wednesday session. Um, when you move to a green supplier, it doesn't essentially mean that you get 100% uh, green electricity uh, in your grid. Uh, you, we get the same mix um, <clears throat> basically as as the national grid provides. So right now the renewables stand at about 30, 35% depending on the on the uh, season and, and weather conditions. However, um, that switch is quite essential because it's it sends a message um, to the markets um, that there is a demand for this type of energy. It also provides invest uh, provides the, the companies, those green companies, with with money to uh, to invest in in infrastructure. Uh, because the the more infrastructure we get, um, a renewable infra infrastructure, the higher will be that percentage of renewables in the grid. Uh, but if you if you if you are really you know impatient and and want to have a absolute Absolutely clean power in your home. The best way is just to go for solar panels, and that they're going to save you money. And that's a, that's a properly clean energy. And yeah, avoid overheating. Um, um, we <laughs> and and as you can see, this comes at a really nice a nice saving. Um, one degree less saves you sixty pounds a year, and 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 quite a lot of carbon emissions as well. So imagine how much you can save going down. You know, two, three, four degrees. Um, but you know, you don't. We don't really need that to to have our houses that uh, uh, hot as we a lot of us do. You know, you can put on uh, you know, another part of another pair of socks or um, or warm socks or or put a jumper on. Uh, you don't have to have such hot such a hot long shower or a bath. Um, just try to be savvy basically uh, with the heat. Okay, so Christmas. Um, don't worry, I love Christmas. I'm not here to ruin Christmas and be all scroogey about it and say it's one sprout between your whole family and things like that. It, you know, we all want a lovely Christmas. And this year, Christmas is obviously going to be a bit different for uh, all sorts of COVID reasons. Um, but maybe that's a good time to start thinking about what changes you and your family can make to also make it a sustainable Christmas so that you're not left with that kind of January angst and and guilt. Um, so on the next slide we've got some quite um, shocking statistics. Um, uh, if you look at the the carbon emissions just of the Christmas roast it's it's huge so uh, 40, over 14,000. What I find really shocking is the figure beneath that is how many of them then just go in the bin so two million turkeys. If you think about the energy involved in raising and rearing those animals to then put them in, in the bin you know, forget humanitarian reasons, just purely from a sort of energy saving reason. That's just a really unsustainable um, activity. Um, the number of Christmas trees that get, get dumped every year. Um, we, we, you know, Christmas is just a really wasteful period. Um, so the, the, our waste um, goes up 30 percent. And we saw earlier the impact of waste on your carbon footprint. Um, things like Christmas jumpers, you know, they're the um, epitome of fast fashion um that they they get bought bought and worn for maybe one or two days there are hundreds of them on ebay at the moment um so if you really want a christmas jumper that's a great place to to start um but it's it, the, the kind of it, they just sum up that kind of the short-term um approach that we have to to christmas and also just the, the the gifts that people feel they need to give more and more and more things and have more and more presents under the tree um 70 million um people get on one 70 million gifts that are received aren't wanted and, and therefore won't get used um which is just a a, a waste uh, uh, um that, that we can't afford and if you think about the energy involved in producing and shipping and then delivering all of those presents um because santa's sleigh can't do it alone then that, the, that that's something that we just we, that can't continue um we, we've got the the wrapping paper alone 277,000 miles of wrapping paper that just gets sent to landfill um and there's been some people always get you know what concerned about christmas trees what's the most sustainable um type of christmas tree um that 
it, there is no perfect solution to this, but probably the best solution is to have a natural Christmas tree and for it to then become recycled. So if you're going to have a tree, make it a natural one, but then make sure that you dispose of it um, really responsibly um, after Christmas. So we've talked about festive wear and wrapping and um, things like um, how you there's some just some tips that people can do while Christmas is on our minds um, already. Um, wear last year's jumper or uh, your kids. We're doing our kids school at Honeywell. We're doing a, a, a pre-loved Christmas jumper sale. So people, the kids can buy the older kids jumpers that they had last year. Um, rent your Christmas dress, borrow it from a friend. And um, for Christmas wrapping in brown paper um, versus because the stuff that's got glitter on it, it can't be recycled. It can't be reused. Um, um, festive decorations I think the, the LED lights um, use a lot less energy use 90% less less energy um, and don't leave them on overnight pretty as they are you turn, turn them off when you go to bed um, in terms of your tree make sure you buy it from a certified source um, you could have a reusable one in a pot and you can hire those as well someone's put in the chat which is a, a great suggestion you can even there's even companies that rent them sadly a lot of them are already sold out um, but some of the smaller ones are still available your meal maybe don't um, act as if we're feeding the, the 5,000 and just buy exactly what you need um, and but also buy the things don't don't have things on the table because it's traditional if people don't enjoy them and they're just going to get picked up and put in the bin save yourself the, the the time and the effort and the and the carbon footprint of those and try and buy stuff that's in season not just that's because a lot of the stuff that people have at this time of year actually is um, not seasonal so things like raspberries for a trifle for example they are absolutely not a seasonal product at this this time of year um, and then festive gifts there's, you know it's really tempting to buy like novelty items especially like fun presents things that are especially when we, we are in the office again and we're doing things like secret santas and things like that there's stuff that people don't then um, use never mind appreciate um, buy, um, buy things that can can be loved and enjoyed for longer um, consider buying second hand consider making a charity donation or giving someone tickets to an art exhibition or something that's a bit you know something that has a much less intensive um, carbon footprint than a, a sort of physical um, entity on the next one I think we've just got some statistics about um, carbon footprint of um, of Christmas um, the, they vary hugely so the the UK average um, adult Christmas um, is, is 280,000 but if you're going all out for Christmas you know you've got your light up reindeers on the roof and things and you're buying presents for everybody and you're traveling widely to go and visit family and things you, you look how high your carbon footprint can end up just just from Christmas um, whereas if you have a sustainable Christmas and you really think about the carbon footprint of everything every aspect of your Christmas um, in terms of how you're decorating your home the presents that you're giving the food that you're enjoying you can actually make it a really sustainable as, as well as enjoyable time of year. Yeah, brilliant. So, uh, yeah, we're getting to an end and, and, and there's one more thing we would like to share with you. Obviously, you know, it's good to apply all those uh, different um, solutions that we, we were just talking about for the, for the last um, couple of minutes. But we have to remember that the change that we need to, to, to transition to, to kind of carbon-free world is not just uh, you know responsibility of individual citizens. It, it, we all need to play our part. All need to work together. Our elected leaders need to create policies and and incentives for people for businesses to move in 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 that net zero direction. Financial institutions they need to support um, <clears throat> green ethical. Uh, investments, um, businesses, they, they have to innovate and they have to change their business models into more sustainable ones. But I would say that we as citizens, we have quite an exceptional role uh, to play in this puzzle. And obviously, you know, as, I, as we just covered lots of those solutions, there, there are those individual things we can do to our lifestyle. But we uh, have quite a lot of roles to play um, uh, in, in the society because we, we and we can go to the next slide, which kind of summarizes that we we are taxpayers, we, we are investors, we are employees, employers, consumers, voters. We have all those many different roles and we have power within those roles to influence the reality and to influence the government, the financial institutions and the business. We can we need to, you know, email, talk to our MPs, 
about the issues that are um, close to our hearts, that we want this transition to happen for the sake of, of you know, of our children and future generations. We can push uh, financial banks and we can change a bank if we don't like the one that we, if, if the one that we have currently doesn't really have good, uh, you know, green credentials. And we can, um, we can talk to our employers about maybe greening the office, maybe actually even changing the way the things, things are done within our company. Some companies, have um, sort of employee groups that work together on implementing those um, those green solutions, and and that's a really great team builder as well. Uh, we are consumers, and 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 Mac has covered you know uh, all those um, the specifics of being a, a sort of a conscious consumer. So we make our choices, and and that's a that's a clear message. We can also push the businesses right to 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 companies, CEOs, and and demand a change. And we're voters, and that's really quite important climate uh, emergency is is the most important issue of our times and if there is an um, there is a politician who wants to get elected and climate is not on the top of his agenda it, it's really you know not worth uh, uh, sparing your vo vote on on that person so vote climate as well and so that all essentially means that we all have to sort of become citizens again we we i i would say that we've probably been sort of um changed into consumers and 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 everyone was talking about us as consumers and even when you think about you know when the first lockdown was was done boris johnson kind of went out to people and said just go out and spend your money and go shopping you know be a good consumer right <laughs> so i think we should just kind of um, go back to to, uh, to thinking that we are citizens and we we have the powers and we we have to activate those powers. Uh, so so yeah, these are the three key takeaways we would like you to remember when you're uh, leaving these sessions. So first, uh, you know. De develop that that personal strategy, that personal plan of reducing your your carbon footprint, and and uh, remember to first measure it, then kind of choose your battles, as I said, and third uh, and third apply a, a strategy that is more uh, most um, aligned with you and your lifestyle. Then consume responsibly, and again, that's that's something that was covered by Meg quite extensively, um, and use your powers. Uh, you've got them. You just have to use them. And yes, just remember that that to make a difference, we don't need a handful of people doing things perfectly. We need millions doing them imperfectly. So, so I think that the most important thing that we would like you, or we would like to left you with, is just be kind to yourself and be kind to other people. We are all trying to do our best, and and we are all hopefully heading in the right direction. Yes, and and join us basically. Uh, if you if you if you found our um, presentation exciting, um, if you want to, if you feel like you want to join a, a climate group, um, please uh, please reach out to us. We're on we're on Facebook, on Twitter, Instagram, Parents for Future Southwest London, and uh, next week on Wednesday we're organizing a um, meet and greet uh, session for for anyone who wants to join, and it's a really good time to join us because we're developing plans um, for next next year and um, now that we have climate uh, we have the council as well on board of, of, of climate emergency we we can really do much more than 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 in the past so so please join us and and let's get uh, let's make a change <laughs> thank you right so I think that we still have some time uh, 15 minutes for for some questions. Uh, if if anyone um, wants to uh, wants to okay yes we've got Rosemary uh, uh, raising her hand yes hello hello everybody that was really interesting really inspiring and being of the older generation um, I look back to my childhood where we did repair things. We did re reuse things and we did make Christmas presents for, you know, grandparents and things like that. And you've inspired me to sort of think more about how I can be less wasteful. Personally, I don't think I am particularly wasteful, but I think when I go go away and and look at what I do do, 
I realise that I can do better. Um, but we are a very wasteful society. You know, the, the throwing away of all of that food is terribly sad. Mm. Um, and buying all of those things we don't need. So I'm going to try and shop early for Christmas this year so that I don't go panic buying at the end. Um, great. Well, that's good to hear. I, mean, I think that's great to hear your planning, your Christmas and how it can be more sustainable. That's great. I, I would really recommend as well checking out one of the carbon calculators online. I will do. Like you say, you don't think you're very wasteful. It can be quite surprising. What's the bit of your life that, that you have the biggest carbon footprint from? And then you can start to think about where you perhaps might be able to make some changes that will have the biggest impact. So it's almost like doing an audit of your lifestyle. And it's, yeah, it's a good place to start. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Um, I think we have some more questions coming. Um, uh, hold on, let me just open this to see. Oh. oh. Uh, yeah, we have Graham here. Yes, please. You need to unmute yourself. Uh, unmute. <laughs> Indeed, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Graham Henderson, councillor for Elsa. Um, certainly don't want this discussion to be dom dominated by, uh, by councillors. Um, I mean, this is a tremendous message, uh, and clearly. This particular forum, uh, the Climate Change Week, is certainly a step in the right direction. Uh, but what do you think the council can do uh, to certainly instill this message uh, much wider within the community as a whole? And indeed, uh, not just the council, but other people as well. Meg, do you want to take this one? Sure, I'll just un I've unmuted. It's all gone all echoey again. Um, I think there's two things. I think it's, it's great the council's doing events like this to sort of encourage individuals to, to think about what, what they can do. But I think a lot of what the um what, what people need to see is that the council's acting as well as a sort of organization to lead this and to help people do things. Some of this is really difficult for us all to do individually. So if we take something like food waste composting it rather than incinerating it can have a huge impact in terms of the carbon footprint of that food waste and it's you know at the moment the expectation is that if people want to do that they'll go and buy their own compost heap to manage that themselves and it would be much easier if we could do that collectively um, at, at a council level um, so I think it's giving people the tools um, to allow them and enable them to, 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 to join in this collectively uh, and, and do it at a sort of a, a local um, community level rather than just as individuals would be great. Yeah, I, 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 to add to that, I think that's quite essential. My husband always says that people don't green, don't go green because it's too difficult. So I guess making it as easy as possible um, is is one thing to go. But I would say also I would wouldn't underestimate. I, I feel like as a parent as well, um, I think schools have quite a, a big responsibility here and can have a lot of impact. And um, um, and we uh, essentially as parents for the future, we're trying to to kind of engage schools in that in that thinking and schools can become green schools eco schools there's lots of frameworks for that but they can also engage community not just you know kids at school and and someone um mentioned and very often we when we talk within our group we talk actually about the influence our children can have on us they are very often much more aware of the problem than than we adults are and um and uh, and yeah and that's and i think schools with with uh, adding the climate um, change topics, the waste topics to their curriculums, they can do much, uh, much on that side as well. Right, so, yeah, thanks, Graham. <laughs> but that was a really good question, I think. Um, uh, also on this one, I, I think there's um, so cli a, gr a group called Climate Outreach, um, uh, which is it's uh, actually that's the, the main part of their um, sort of activity. They're they're doing research on people's attitudes uh, towards climate change and how to communicate. They on Wednesday they've announced the the, the very latest research. Um, and if you go to their website, a climate outreach uh, co dot uk, I believe that is that's that's the one. They have a great tool where very interactive where you can actually. 
uh, go and see all those different groups with their different attitudes and and proposals of how to reach out to those groups and that's that's really a good a good tool for everyone who who wants to engage in the climate and i'm just looking at the conversation whether we have any questions in the chat um but i don't think so um is there anyone else who would like to ask a question or maybe add a, you know, OK, Kim, we have you. <laughs> um, it was just picking up your point, really, about, uh, you know, education and what schools can be doing. Um, and I, I actually work for Wandsworth Children's Services and we annually we run an event called Munger, which is a mini United Nations debating competition uh for schools which is which is very popular and strangely enough our our theme for 2021 and it's going to be online and virtual is about the fast fashion industry um and so we're we're actually um tackling all of the issues around you know the impact in terms of on 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 countries globally um and issues to do with uh, around you know recycling and reusing and also tapping into what the council are currently doing with regards to 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 those areas so it was just to let you know that that you know children's services are are actually very much on board with this uh and it would be really helpful if you know maybe we could involve yourselves in in maybe some of those workshops so I, I i i kind of throw that out to you uh as an option to work collaboratively and uh so uh, it was just to kind of pick up on that particular point yeah we'd love to have i think that really fits with our um you know our whole ethos about supporting young people um, within this as well so yeah we'd be delighted so do drop us a line Definitely I certainly will, and, and it's been a really, really useful session as well. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's really nice to hear. Um, all right. Any any more questions? I'm just uh, following the conversation on on the chat, and there's uh, there there's there, yeah, just trying to see if there are any any questions. Yes, that idea that someone posted about making um, one of our roles be the greenest in London. It would be great if one could lead the way on something like that. So just ban single use plastics, make everything you know, as zero waste as possible. Um, it, you know, that would be great for the goal, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think generally sort of in, uh, kind of um, creating a coalition of, you know, people in the borough and giving them a, a purpose that's always a thing that can work out. So, and I think you know that 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 very ambitious objective of becoming a greenest borough that is a really um, engaging objective. And I feel like you know if if we all sort of collectively um, act on this, we can achieve that goal. But yeah. And someone was asking a question in the chat about. Um, do you think uh, ones with councillors should be role models in how they travel? <laughs> Why not? Yes, yes. Councillors. What do you think? I, don't, I don't want to you know, point fingers at people and make them feel bad if they don't you know, travel brilliantly, but I'd hope that their employers make it easy for them to travel actively to work and travel less um, with their jobs and things like that. I also think even they as individuals, you know, if they're thinking about their behaviour at an individual level, um, it's going to have a limited impact. I'd, I'd kind of rather they drove to work and then when they were there, spent some time um, implementing decent cycle infrastructure because um, that would have a much bigger impact across the whole um, borough. But ideally, yeah, ideally everybody would, would, would do that and model good behaviour um, and, and make it norm the normal way to travel. Um, yeah, I, I think there, there probably is a good, good argument for that as well. Yeah, I think we have a, a Rosemary who wants to add to that. Please do, Rosemary. Yes, I just did want to say that this councillor does try to walk. I do use my bicycle as well, but I try to do as much as my work around my... It's the nicest board. way to get around one person. Yeah, I need to walk. So, yeah, but I think that was a very good idea, whoever suggested it. But, but as you say, we need to also to be supporting um, active travel for everybody else and and we are supporting that and um, and supporting, you know, bicycling. And we've got bicycle 
hangers that have started to go up so people can put their so keep their bicycles secure so you know there are all sorts of things that are going on but there's always more and we will work on it yeah yeah as someone said sustainability is a is a lot is a never-ending journey <laughs> so, and I, I kind of agree with that there's always something more you can do graham you wanted to add something and mute. <laughs> oh. Yes. Yeah. Long last. Sorry. Uh, IT problems. Um, yes. I mean, I, I do actually think perhaps that question should be directed at those councillors who aren't actually on this particular call. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I don't want to sort of treat like the debate over low traffic neighbourhoods. Uh, that actually, I think, sort of brought the whole issue into fairly sharp relief. Um, between essentially a minority of people who were incredibly vocal in being opposed uh, to the development of uh, low traffic neighbourhoods. Uh, which was actually came from the government. Um, they put the council on, under considerable pressure, and sadly, in my opinion, the council or the majority of the council actually uh, gave in. And I think um, there are a number of lessons from that. I mean, certainly across Wandsworth, only sort of one in two of only one in two of all households have cars. Now, I'm not anti-car. I do have a car myself. Um, I think the last time I took it for an MOT, um, I registered less than a thousand miles in a year. So I do tend to sort of use use it for essentially journeys, essentially when I'm sort of carrying heavy, heavy equipment, etc. Um, and I'm certainly not trying to make myself out to be a parent, but I think those people who clearly do want an active travel policy actually need to be as vocal, if not more vocal, than those who frankly want to continue in the same way as they have been for the past 20, 30, 40 years, where sadly the car has actually dictated transport policy. Uh, and the council are making some shift certainly towards active travel. Um, I think certainly myself, um, my fellow councillor, uh, Joe Rigby, um, feels it certainly could be um, more radical, more active. But, you know, we, we have at least got the council to do something which fundamentally, you know, was certainly 10 years ago quite alien uh, to the entire approach. So I think we are all moving in the right direction. And I certainly don't want to, want to be sort of too critical. But I do think there is a lot more that needs to be done. And in particular, I do think that those people who believe in active travel need to be much more vocal about it. Thank you. Yeah, that is a good point. I think the, the, the debate became so polarised, it almost became a slightly daunting place to go and have your, your say. But I think those of us that do care passionately about it probably should be you know, out there defending defending that other side of the argument more as well. I think there's other lessons we could probably learn as well in terms of you know how it was communicated as well to people. Um, so you know, if we are looking at things like um, food waste trials, there's loads of you know lessons that we should apply there in terms of you know, how we make people understand the importance of it and, and feel consulted and involved and and, and empowered to do it right um so I, I think yeah hopefully that will we'll all learn from that and, and i think there's a space for the for the council to collaborate with different groups across the borough on that because yeah. it, you know we can we can also help out uh, with with kind of providing that information and communicating mm -hmm. why so some things are important and others are not. The problem, I guess, is always that, you know, those people who are opposing things are, as you said, 
always more vocal than those who support it. And I'm terrified. Recently, there was a research done across London, and it turned out that actually more people support the love traffic neighborhoods than than those who who oppose them. But but it feels like it feels like it's completely the opposite. So I would say you're absolutely right. We should we should sort of be 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 out there and and talk. And I think Rosemary wants to add something as well. <laughs> so good. To yes, can I just <laughs> say why we pulled the low traffic neighborhoods? And and it it wasn't because of it wasn't only because there was a lot of objections. Unfortunately, it the low traffic neighborhoods went in at the same time as the new cycle lane in the A24. Um, so it was difficult to see which of these two initiatives that were put in at the same time was causing most traffic chaos. And there was an awful lot of traffic chaos, which so, but the reason we pulled it was because of the pollution increase. Because what happened as a knock on was that the there was so much traffic pushed to the the other roads that there was a lot of idling traffic and there was a great increase in pollution. And as actually Councillor Rigby, I think, pointed out, you know, it's a, often the those main roads who have got people living in flats above the shops. Um, they are not the privileged people who live in the low traffic neighborhoods. They're the people who live on the, the main roads and they were suffering because of the excess pollution. So that was the reason why we, why we pulled them or why I personally supported pulling them. It was the increase in the pollution that those people were suffering. But I do, I do agree, we've got to work on its nudge, I think, to encourage people like myself to use my car less. And, and to think, can I do several things on what, if I've got to take my car out, achieve several things at the same time? so that we all start using our cars less. Um, and the car clubs, I think, are a great thing, because that does mean that a lot of the young people are not buying a car. So, you know, they use the car club when they, they really need a car. The rest of the time, they'll be using active travel. So, you know, we are, we are trying and, yeah. And do do you well, think there'll be another um, trial of the LTNs at a later date? I think it's, I agree. It's a difficult time to take a clear read on it because we don't know if yeah. more people were driving because um, they didn't feel safe on public transport because we just came yes. out of lockdown or uh, you know difficult. But it'd be great to, to do another trial, perhaps with more comms and consultation if we know that was one of the barriers. I, that there won't. Yeah. I'm I'm not on that committee any longer, so I cannot answer that question. But. There will not be anything dropped on people just like that. There will be more con consultation. And my opinion is that we need to possibly make each area smaller. I, d I don't know. But, but. Well, we'd, we'd love to be involved in any consultation yeah. around it. And, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm sure things that will happen, but I'm not sure when and why and how okay right brilliant so, okay. Thank, thank you thank you very much um i think we're running out <laughs> we've run out of time already yeah. thank you so much um for for this uh, really great conversation i hope we're i would love to you know have another one uh, <laughs> uh, on this and and i'm sure you know a lot of people in our group would love to be involved so so please um, please, uh, a message to the council, organize <laughs> another meeting that where we can actually share our um, our ideas and our um, feedback to all the different things council is doing. Um, thank you so much to Amy, who uh, who's who you cannot see, but uh, but she was the the kind of uh, a big big help 
uh, she helped us a lot and um, to to organize this this talk. And I hope everyone who was on on the talk found that um, uh, interesting and and uh, mostly we would like you to to feel inspired and take action and use. Should we just say quickly about next Wednesday as well, Marta? So um, if anyone um, felt inspired to join um, Parents for Future Southwest London, you don't need to be a parent. Um, we welcome everybody um, who cares about the future of children and future generations um, to join us. And next Wednesday lunchtime, we're going to have an open to all Zoom call um, for people to join us and, and hear a bit more about what we're planning for next year and, and see if there's any way you can get involved um, and help that. Yes, and, and thank you so much uh, for joining today. Thank you and have a lovely weekend. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye. -bye.